Hi, it's Dwyer. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. It is Friday, November the 1st, 2019. Right the day before Canelo's attempt to wrestle the light heavyweight championship away from Sergei Kovalev. Let's talk boxing, but first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now let me just say to those of you who saw the earlier video that I did on this fight, which is still on YouTube, I still believe what I said in that video. Right, this fight is a bit shocking for a few reasons we'll discuss. But just understand I still see the fight <clears throat> and the betting strategy the way I did when I made that first video. We'll repeat the concepts here. I'll even direct you to a fight that I feel is the blueprint on this fight. Right, but first let's just give background because I believe this fight deserves to be hyped. Right now, every sport has its holy grail set of records that connote brilliance, dominance. You hear the record, you understand the record holder. Right in the National Football League here in the United States, we know Tom Brady has won six Super Bowls. Right, that's the gold standard. You're thinking about Super Bowls, you know there's one guy with more than everybody else. Right? In baseball, this Yankee fan who's still wearing his Red Sox Halloween costume has always thought of the number 56 because it shows the determination, the focus Joe DiMaggio had in game after game to get hits in game after game. Right? There are other records in baseball. There are other records in other sports, right? In football, I know a few men have been over 2,000 rushing yards. But trust me, nobody did 2,000 yards in 14 games the way O.J. Simpson did. Right? So, let me just say this. You have an audacious pivot here in the sport of boxing. It's historical. Right? After two contentious and controversial fights against one of the best middleweights in history. Right? Understand, Golovkin's body of work puts him there with people like Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Carlos Monzon, Bernard Hopkins, and Golovkin had a KO streak going at middleweight, right, until that Danny Jacobs fight. Well, let me just say this. After two contentious fights against Golovkin, and with big money, fame, and the opportunity at a trilogy looking him in the face, Canelo, who I have a lot of respect for, has pivoted away from Golovkin towards an even bigger opponent. <clears throat> Not Kovalev, but Homicide Hank, Henry Armstrong. Understand, in boxing, when you talk about dominance, one of the holy grail facts from the sports history is that Henry Armstrong, when the sport only had eight weight classes, did something that Manny Pacquiao never did, Floyd Mayweather has never done. He held three of the weight class titles at the same time. He was the featherweight champ. He then gained weight to fight the welterweight champ, if you can believe that. He beat the welterweight champ. He then decided, why not? It's there for me. He lost weight. Fought the lightweight champ. Beat him. 
So Homicide Hank had three belts in three different weight classes simultaneously. Now the secret to this fight is what makes Canelo tick. He's the middleweight champ. He beat Rocky Fielding for the super middleweight championship. Now he's going for the light heavyweight championship. Folks, I get the feeling that his opponent could have been Ezra Charles, light heavyweight legend. He would still have taken the match. Right, Canelo's at that point in his career where, keep in mind, he's already, in my opinion, a surefire first ballot Hall of Famer. Right, you just say, hey, he fought Golovkin multiple times, never lost to him, right? His only losses is legendary. It was to Floyd Mayweather. And even that loss is interesting because, while I disagree with this, one of the judges had that fight a draw, right? You don't have that in a lot of Mayweather fights. But understand, just like Tom Brady, who has six rings, is in his 40s, has money in the bank, has a gorgeous wife, is clearly a first ballot Hall of Famer, it's just not enough. Tom Brady is back out there in his 40s, continuing to play football. Canelo beats Danny Jacobs. That's after beating Golovkin. Right? Jacobs and Golovkin were really the two bad men at 160. These were the two guys you thought fighters wanted to avoid. Canelo's fought both of them. Right now, Canelo, we thought it was a fluke trip to 168 to fight Rocky Fielding. By the way, revisit that fight. You know how you see fighters in big arenas. Vladimir Klitschko against Brian Jennings at Madison Square Garden. And the fighters unable to sell out the arena. Here's Canelo with no experience at 168. He fights Rocky Fielding, who isn't a household name in households that follow boxing. And folks, Madison Square Garden was standing room only. You couldn't get in Madison Square Garden. Everyone was there to see the fight. Look on TV. You know how sometimes they have tight camera shots. They don't want you seeing the empty seats. Tyson Fury's recent fights in Las Vegas, right? The camera's up on the fighters, kind of like my laptop here is up on me, right? With Canelo, you got the wide view. <laughs> this guy is so popular. He's so much a box office king that they were able to show you Madison Square Garden. And what you didn't see with them showing you, you know, ring level and up, what you didn't see were empty seats. So this guy now is trying at the same time to hold the middleweight, super middleweight, and light heavyweight titles. Right? His opponent is really Henry Armstrong. Think of the great modern-day fighters you know. And I know Floyd went through several weight classes. Manny went through several weight classes. But not like this. Right? Canelo will be fighting at 175 while holding the title at 160. Right? Think about it. Well, let me just say this. And I'll agree, I know there's some people older than me who watch my videos who will say, hey, wait a moment now. Right? Homicide Hank, when he decided to make the jump from Feather, had to jump 
weight classes, right? These days we have junior this, super that. Just the fact that I mentioned a super middleweight division has lost some old timers. Or you're saying, hey, wait a moment. You know, the weight classes are really lightweight, welterweight, middleweight, <laughs> light heavyweight, right? Ray Robinson, when he decides to leave the middleweight division, he had to travel to light heavyweight for the next division, right? There was no 168 title. Okay, I'll agree with that. What Hank did was astonishing. <clears throat> but let's praise a fighter who's popular who already has the big deal from the zone who's openly seeking the toughest records in the sport right three weight classes at the same time you gotta be kidding me but yet this guy who's already popular who already sells out big venues who already has the big money still is unsatisfied. So he's going for history here. Let me also say this. He's picked a formidable champion. A guy who's beaten Bernard Hopkins. A guy who's beaten Nathan Cleverly. A guy who's beaten Jean Pascal. Understand, Kovalev didn't win the title yesterday. He actually held the title from 2013 to 2016. He then loses to Andre Ward, right? I had the fight score differently. Ward hits the canvas, not Kovalev. It's a close fight. If you believe that Ward won the fight, it's a photo finish fight. Let me also say too, Kovalev fades in that fight. That's important because one of the stories in this is the stamina of both men. Right, Canelo has picked it up a bit, but when Canelo, excuse me, when Canelo was, you know, a welterweight slash a 154 pounder, he would fade in fights. He seemed to be taking parts of rounds off. Right, he fights El Perro. Alfredo Angulo, and he looked like he was fading in that fight. He looked like he had to take a minute of each round off. Well, you also have stamina issues in some Kovalev fights. Right? I encourage you to look at Kovalev's work in the second half of the Ward fight. Understand, if he steps on the gas, there's no doubt who wins that first fight. Ward, a master, makes adjustments. One of the reasons why, it's a big reason, why Kovalev fades in that fight is Andre Ward. But understand there are questions about Kovalev's stamina. Now let me say this because I'm one of those who sees this line and cannot understand it to the gamblers out there, to my core group. You're getting Kovalev, depending on the shop, at a plus 350 or a plus 325. Right? What they're telling you is that if these guys fought four and a half times, Canelo, a guy who has never fought at light heavyweight, would beat the reigning light heavyweight champion three and a half out of the four and a half times. That's ridiculous. Let me go one step further. Andre Ward, and we have to make hard decisions here. This isn't a fan side. Andre Ward is a better athlete than Saul Alvarez. Ward could move around the ring. Right? Now let me say this. Ward came up at 168 right he gained weight we all get older we all gain weight and so he was then at 175 he might not have been the puncher at 175 that I think Canelo might be understand Canelo as I've been saying here for years online 
is one of the hardest punchers pound for pound in the sport. When you look at Canelo, right, you notice that he's not a light guy fighting in a heavy weight class. Rather, he's a guy who has a thick neck. You look at his age, he's still in his 20s, you realize he started out, he hit the public consciousness in a fighting family, brothers are boxers, right? In a fighting family, he hits the public consciousness at 19, right? In fact, earlier than that, as a teenager, right? We may have seen young Canelo. Canelo's adult weight, quite frankly, might be north of 175 pounds. Understand the punching power. He fought a former champion at 168, Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. Granted, the fight was at a catch weight, 164. He clearly hit harder than Chavez Jr., clearly. In his one fight at 168, he fights Rocky Fielding. His game plan was to get inside on Rocky Fielding and to take out his body. In other words, Canelo has such confidence in his punching power that in a new weight class, his game plan relied on his punching power. And that's what he did. He has Fielding backed up against the ropes in that fight. He goes to town on Fielding's body. There's never a moment in that fight that you felt that Fielding wasn't feeling the power of Canelo's shots. But what I want people to consider is a different dynamic here that I think is the secret to the fight. Right? Kovalev, just imagine if you were him. You have a Larry Holmes level jab. He has a great jab, folks. Right now, could you imagine having this level of jab? and having people overlook it. This is like having a Vladimir Klitschko jab. We'll, we'll name some great jabbers who people don't seem to realize a big part of their success was to jab. Sonny Liston, his protege who he sparred with. Big George Foreman, right? Carlos Monzon. When I look at the film, I see a two by four. I see a bazooka on Monzon's shoulder that he's bludgeoning guys with. Don't get me wrong, these guys had other tools, other power. Certainly Kovalev can hit you with a hook and take you out. But the jab sets the table. The jab keeps guys outside. Now more importantly, at 36, Kovalev still has the timing. What I want people to do is to revisit his last fight against a guy who likely hits harder than Canelo. And that's Anthony Yard. Right? Yard, by the way, still has a very bright future in boxing. But boxing's a craft. Right? Young guys can't just rush into the castle and then sit on the throne and think they're king in boxing. Right? Boxing has layers. Right? So... Anthony Yard is fighting Kovalev. Yard's younger. Yard has a big punch. Right? Guys hit by Yard look like they've been in car crashes. And Kovalev keeps Yard at the end of a jab. Andre Ward, better athlete. Just look at how he moves. Moves much better than Canelo with a knee brace. First fight goes the distance. The second fight, what I want you to do is to, before the last round, look at the rest of the fight. Folks, that second fight is up for grabs. Kovalev is moving around. Kovalev knows how to use the spacing that his great jab gives him. So Andre Ward, who moves better, moves better, who got inside on Mikhail Kessler and stayed there. 
that Andre Ward, right, is moving around and is playing a chess match against Kovalev, who's holding his own. Look at the scorecards for that fight. Also, think about the infamous last round of the fight. Think about what changes the fight. It's a right hand from distance. Right? There's so much distance between the two guys that guys with ring coverage, Deontay Wilder, I'm sure if he looks at that film, he feels proud of Andre Ward. Ward is far away from Kovalev. Hits him with a straight right hand. That's the beginning of the end. Kovalev then folds up like a lawn chair. Now that's another problem in this fight. Right? When Kovalev's in trouble, whether it's against Andre Ward, whether it's against Elidor Alvarez, the first fight, Kovalev folds up like a lawn chair. He's not the fighter who looks like he has survival skills. He's not the guy you ding halfway through the round who then finds a way to hug you <laughs> and to move behind you and to hold your arm and to turn his back to buy time. He's not a guy who can buy time. But the point is simply this. If a guy who moves better, who's a master, Andre Ward is an obvious first ballot Hall of Famer, understand. Andre's resume includes wins over people like Carl Frotch, who I think is going to be in the Hall of Fame as well. Right? Mikhail Kessler. Several of Sakio Bika. Right? Understand against the master who could move. When I first watched Ward films, I couldn't tell if he was right or left handed. You're talking about a bigger version of Terrence Crawford. Right? Against Ward, who had a level of movement I don't expect from Canelo in this fight. Kovalev goes the distance the first time, then with the familiarity. That second fight makes it past the first six rounds. That's with the familiarity. Anthony Yard. How many times did Yard hit Kovalev flush? Yard was unbeaten. We're talking about Kovalev's most, most recent fight. Right? Because there's concerns on age here. In his most recent fight, Kovalev had a young lion in front of him, an unbeaten one. Keeps him at the end of a jab. Does get caught. Ends up with his back up against the ropes. Is able to clear his head. Right? Yard comes this close to lifting the title. But understand, Yard doesn't catch Kovalev for several rounds. You're outside the first six rounds of that fight. How does that fight end? With Yard bludgeoned by Kovalev's jab. That's what Larry Holmes' jab does for you. By the way, that fight is just like a lot of fights guys with great jabs have. They look like they're in it, they look like they're in it, they look like they're in it, then suddenly there's that round where they just get hit with one jab too many and it's over. Guy's on the canvas. The guy's beaten up. The guy is finished. Now in this fight, there's been trash talk. There's been talk of Canelo going to Kovalev's body, and I agree. I believe Kovalev's underfed. I believe Kovalev has to starve himself to make weight at 175 because cruiserweight, one floor up, is 200. I don't believe Kovalev is as healthy as some of these young lions are. There's been talk of Canelo going to Kovalev's body like he went to Rocky Fielding's body. Let's stop kidding ourselves. The side of the play that you need to be on, because the line is simply ridiculous, is the Kovalev to win by plus 350. That's the side you have to be on. Because you know in your heart 
the idea of Kovalev being a plus 350 when he has fought Hopkins and Ward. He's fought Hall of Famers at the weight class. Right? I know Hopkins establishes himself in middleweight. I know Ward establishes himself at super middleweight. But just to understand, the skill levels, Ward and Hopkins are obvious Hall of Famers. You don't even have to think about it. Right? The fact that Kovalev has that level of experience, the fact that it's his title, the fact that Canelo has no experience at 175, the fact that the odds are preposterous. Understand, I wouldn't expect Kovalev to be a plus 350 against Arthur Baturbiev, one of the other champs at 175, or against Bivol, who might be the best champ at 175. The fact that you're getting these odds, you've got to lock those in. The only question for me is the hedge. That's the only question. Keep in mind, too, at middleweight, Golovkin goes the distance twice with Canelo. Danny Jacobs, who's weight-drained, so weight-drained, he skips the follow-up weigh-in and is fined heavily for it. Jacobs was so weight-drained, his next fight is going to be at 168. Jacobs goes the distance against Canelo. Right, so my point to you is the odds are so ridiculous. One half of your bet has to be Kovalev simply to win at plus 350. The hedge, I believe, is to just bet, and you're going to have to fool around with prop bets here, to just bet that if Canelo wins, it'll be in the second half of the fight or by decision. Right, so if you do group betting, you might want to take Canelo around 7 to 9 and 10 to 12, right? Or take Canelo round 7 to 9 and then just take the over, right? My point to you is the fight's mispriced. So you want the plus 350 on the division's champ, Kovalev, and you want to hedge the play in a way where you're safe as long as Kovalev makes it out of the first six rounds. Right, folks? This isn't Rocky Fielding. Kovalev's back foot is the key to this fight. Back foot behind a jab. Right? The fight's kind of turned backwards. The bigger man. Right? The taller man, at least. Let's not call him bigger, because when you look at the necks, Canelo has a huge neck. You look at the shoulders, Canelo is solid. Right? But the taller man, who has the experience at the weight class, who has the better jab, in my opinion, needs to be on his back foot. Work the jab. Not be close. One of the things Ali did, one of the things Kovalev has done, guys who can throw a good jab know to maximize distance between the two of you. So rather than throw the jab standing upright, the guys who really know how to throw a jab will lean forward. Right? Their feet will be over here. They'll lean forward and then throw the jab. If Kovalev gets full extension on his jab, and has his body out of the way. I think Canelo, at least for the first six rounds, is going to have a hell of a hard time finding his body. Understand what champions do to get inside. Look at Joe Fraser, right? He's bobbing and weaving. He's active, right? Jack Dempsey, bobbing and weaving. It's underrated, but look at Mike Tyson's upper body, right? Prime Mike Tyson was moving his upper body, right? It takes energy. 
Don't be Rocky Fielding. Don't allow Canelo to come in and not use energy. Not even try to dodge your shots. Just come in low and try to hit you to the body. No. Force him to try to bob and weave. So what Kovalev needs to do, what his cornermen, people forget, Buddy McGirt used to be called Mr. Magoo back in the day. Buddy McGirt had a back foot. Buddy McGirt was a champion. Right? What Buddy McGirt needs to have Kovalev do is to give himself room to back up. Right? He has to stick the jab in Canelo's face. He has to force Canelo to work. Folks, the guy has a knee brace. He has to force him to bob and weave. Then he needs to stay off the ropes. Don't give Canelo an opportunity to have you lodged against the ropes like he had Liam Smith lodged against the ropes. Don't give him that opportunity. This requires a guy who can move around the ring. Marquez. Right, who can move around the ring, who's comfortable on his back foot, throwing a jab. Keeping the other guy outside. Having certain punches for when the guy slips the jab. Canelo slips the jab, you have that uppercut ready. Right, the point here is that Kovalev shouldn't assume that a good big man beats a good little man and then decide we're going to make this a shootout. What I want the boxing historians to do too is look at light heavyweight champs in history. You're going to find people like Dwight Cowie, the Camden buzzsaw, little guy who was in there fighting people like Evander Holyfield, giving them all they could handle. Right? Canelo's size does not disqualify him from being a legitimate light heavyweight. This is the guy who might be smaller, but he's dangerous. Right? You wouldn't want to deal with Mike Tyson at light heavyweight. Right? You wouldn't want to deal with Rocky Marciano at light heavyweight. If I'm Kovalev, I get on my back foot. Right? He wants the middle of the ring. He can have the middle of the ring. I just make sure I have room to back up. And I have this guy walking in to my jab, right? If I loosen him up enough with the jab, then I'll come over the side with right hands. You want a great fight? A guy with a great jab who knew how to use it? Look at the Vladimir Klitschko-Ray Austin fight, folks. I'm not sure Vladimir Klitschko throws a right hand. He softens up Ray Austin with the jab. Then he starts coming in with left hooks. Now the fight, I think, and it's on YouTube, is how this fight should go. Kovalev on his back foot using lateral movement. Right? Henry Armstrong, the guy who had three belts, <laughs> three weight classes at the same time. The featherweight who decides he wants the welterweight title and beats Barney Ross for crying out loud, right? That guy, he falls on hard times late in his career. He had over 100 fights. Hell, he had over 100 KOs. Look him up on Box Rec. Well, he fights a guy, Walker Smith. You may know him as Sugar Ray Robinson. Now, Ray Robinson, big-time puncher. Big-time puncher. Right, this fight's in the 140s. Understand, Robinson, who eventually becomes middleweight champion, was a different level. He was at his best at welterweight. So what is Robinson, the big puncher, the definition of boxer puncher in the sports history? What does Robinson do against Hank, who is smaller, who is as I suspect Canelo will be, who's trying to get inside. Right? Henry Armstrong wants to trade with Sugar Ray Robinson. Again, the fight's on YouTube. So Ray Robinson gets on his back foot. I'm telling you, technicians have no shame. 
right? If it takes a technician to leave the pocket, to get on his back foot, to use lateral movement, if it requi if winning requires being beta and not alpha, that's what a technician will do. So that's what Ray Robinson does. The fight's not close. Right? Armstrong is trying to get inside. Ray's keeping him outside the pocket for most of the fight. Ray's using lateral movement to cause Armstrong to reset. And of course, Ray Robinson had a great jab. He's flicking the jab. <laughs> He's, you know, one way to keep a fighter outside is to hit him. Right? Now, I'll agree. Canelo is excellent, excellent at hiding his head. Danny Jacobs can't find it early in their fight, right? That's why Kovalev has to hit Canelo to the body. Don't rely on finding his head. Hit him in the bicep. Hit him in places where, if you do it right, you're going to wear him down. A guy who gets hit on the bicep enough, hey, that hand might be useless later. That hand, which might have a lot of power, might actually be dissipated by the end of the fight. Right, that power might not be what it was if if that bicep muscle wasn't hit as often. So if Kovalev doesn't let ego get the best of him, if he fights the fight he fought against Anthony Yard, look at that fight. Yard's there in front of him. Kovalev understands. This guy's younger than me, might hit harder than me. He's unbeaten. He doesn't know he could lose. Right? Kovalev understands all that. Kovalev's older now. Right? Kovalev has lost the title twice before. He's the guy who has been counted out. Who is now a guy I believe you can count on to get by the first six rounds. So Kovalev gives yard space. There's no rush. There's no urgency. Kovalev needs to be patient. He needs to be on his back foot. He needs to use lateral movement. He needs to stay off the ropes. Not let Canelo get up any steam. If he comes in and he throws a few jabs and Canelo hides his head, throw the jabs to the body. Don't recklessly enter the pocket. Don't try to trade with Canelo. If he does that, he has a shot to defend his title. I'm certainly, I'm already on the plus 350 side of the play. I don't think I got plus 350. I think I got plus 325. Hell, I'll take that. Right? I have some bets about the second half of the fight. I'm going to have to fine-tune that. So, I'm guaranteed a profit if the fight makes it past the end of the sixth round. I know it sounds ridiculous. Right? You're thinking, gee, how could the odds be such that if the start of the seventh round happens, you could be on the money? Don't blame me. Blame Vegas. What is a reigning light heavyweight champion doing at a plus 325 or plus 350 against a guy whose last fight was at middleweight against a guy who has never fought at light heavyweight. Folks, these weight classes matter. Right? Maybe Canelo is badass. I don't believe he's going to be able to run across the ring, start hammering on Kovalev, and then stop him in the first six rounds. Understand, Andre Ward beat a light heavyweight champion before he fought. Kovalev, right? He, he, he beat Chad Dawson. Right? Andre Ward, skilled fighter, ambidextrous fighter, better athlete than Canelo, understood he couldn't just rush in on Kovalev. And the first time he fought, Ward ended up on the canvas. Right? My point to you is, the idea that Canelo is this much of a favorite Canelo's going off at a minus 450, folks. 
The Canelo side of the play is telling you if they fought five and a half times, Canelo would win four and a half of the five. Right? It's ridiculous. The fight's mispriced. I know the fight's in Vegas. Fine. Kovalev needs to ignore the crowd. He needs to just use a jab, consider the jab his best weapon, and use his legs. Right? Stay on the outer rim of the pocket. Have a swivel for an upper body. In other words, when he's throwing the jab, lean forward. Maximize the length. When Canelo starts throwing on him, back away. Have room to back away. Don't be one of these guys who is outside, then ends up walking into the ropes and getting stopped like every other Gravante Davis opponent. Anyway, that's how I see it. I think the fight makes it to the latter half of the fight. Right? The must part of the bet is Kovalev to win. You're getting compensated for it at better than a plus 300. Right? The way I'm going to try to play it is to buy a round option and then take the over. So I'm covered if anything happens after the sixth round. But this isn't the Rocky Fielding fight. Kovalev's not going to get stopped in the first half of this fight. I think Kovalev has legs. I think Kovalev has the benefit of having watched the Golovkin fights. Golovkin's jab is very effective in that rematch, as well as the Danny Jacobs fight, right? Where Jacobs is throwing jabs that can't land on Canelo, who's moving his upper body. Right? I believe Buddy McGirt, and I know the Kovalev side has said, will he take our body punch? Hey, don't even try to find out. Spend the early rounds just with jab, left hook. If there's an opening, straight right hand. Keep a distance. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I know there are a lot of views out there. Let it rip in the comment section to this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.